This past week, Aaron and I traveled from Boise, Idaho to Suzhou, China to visit Fetus and get a behind the scenes look at their manufacturing process. While I've been involved in 3D printing for over a decade, I've never had the opportunity to get this insight, so I was very excited to see and share this with everyone. This was also my first time visiting China, and we had such a good experience that we're already looking forward to future visits. The entire tour was live streamed on Fetus's channel, but I brought along a camera and grabbed a bunch of footage and even got some additional behind the scenes. In today's video, we'll be diving into this tour and take you along the journey as we cover everything from manufacturing, QC, assembly, and finally the finished products. So with all that being said and without further ado, let's get right into today's video. Today's video is sponsored by FlexiSpot. Looking for the perfect upgrade to your workspace? The FlexiSpot E7 Plus Standing Desk has you covered. Transform your setup and experience better posture with effortless height adjustments. With a 540 pound weight capacity and four leg design, this desk is built to stay steady no matter what. Customizable presets, a built-in USB charger, and a 15-year warranty are what make the E7 Plus a standout choice. With tons of customization options from color, size, desk material, and accessories, this is an incredibly versatile desk. And right now, during FlexiSpot's Black Friday sale, you can save an additional $50 on your E7 Plus using the code in the description. Don't wait, upgrade your workspace today. Starting at the beginning on the first floor, we walked right into the check-in area and showroom. This is where I was briefly confused because the sign and logo behind the desk said Runis and not Fetus. After meeting Donald, the vice president, he explained to me that Runis is essentially the parent company. They've been manufacturing 3D printing components for OEMs as far back as 2013. Fetus is their first party company that was created in 2019, starting with the introduction of the Dragon Hot End. So while Fetus may be five years old, the company itself has been around for over a decade. The showroom contained a range of nozzles, hot ends, and extruder parts they make covering everything from brass to hardened steel and even ruby tipped. They also had a display of their filaments, which heavily emphasized composites and other specialty materials. Of course, they also had a section dedicated to the growing lineup of Fetus hot ends, nozzles, and extruders. I always find the history of a company fascinating, and along the wall they had a timeline with key years for the company. This included major milestones, key product releases, acquisitions, and partnerships. They also had a world map containing their resellers and customers with some big names most of us are familiar with. The hallway ends with some key stats, including their total hot end sales, which was 600,000, and nozzles at a massive 5.5 million units. The final segment of the wall is dedicated to patents that the company holds stemming back from its inception. Moving beyond this, we journeyed into the production workshop, which is by far what I was most excited for. This massive floor contains 40 Swiss CNC lathes, seven large CNC machines, and an assortment of other machines. The majority of the parts being produced are on the lathes. There were a total of four rows, each containing 10 lathes, that were paired in opposite directions to optimize space. The process for each was pretty automated. Each machine has a section for the raw bar stock next to it and a feeder. The technician would grab the stock, feed it into the machine, and then the machine would take over and produce the parts. When a part finished, it would be fed out of a compartment where the technician grabbed it, did an initial QC check, and placed it into a jig where it would sit until the entire batch was complete. I've really only ever seen manual lathes, so seeing these in action was really cool. These machines had built-in tool changers and used machine oil for coolant during the cutting process. A huge part of running an operation this large is having spare parts and organization, which there was no lack of. They had a huge room dedicated to pins, gauges, and collets. The organization was top notch and consisted of a massive bin system hooked up to a computer. This allowed the technician to enter in whatever they need and the bin popped out with the correct part, both speeding up the process and ensuring the correct tool is being used. The collets are used for grabbing the different size stock and range from really fine to large diameter to account for the wide range of products being produced. I also got to see a little behind the scenes of their software systems for starting, tracking, and verifying orders as they came in and were produced. 
Each station had a technical drawing of the part being ran, and a series of checks done by the technician throughout each batch. One thing that was really cool to see was the addition of a robotic arm that was attached to some of these lathes. Unlike the manual placement, on these units, as soon as a part is produced, an arm grabs the part, feeds it to another arm, and then places it precisely into a jig. This is currently used on machines producing parts in softer metals to prevent any scratching or damage, but I was told that the goal is to eventually implement them across the board. There was a second room with the same organization as the pins and gauges, but for all of the tools used on the machines. This serves a dual purpose of making it easy to find the needed tool, but it also let them keep track of hours and wear on each tool. With this, they can make sure to swap out a tool before it's too worn and starts to have a negative impact on tolerances. They also had a room for the technicians with high-powered microscopes where they can examine parts during processing if they need to verify anything that they can't inspect directly at the machine. One of the side rooms had a few large grinders used to finish tubes that had been made on the lathes. These used diamond wheels to quickly get the outer diameter to an even finer tolerance of up to four microns. Another machine in the room is used to clear roughness inside of the tubes and also get it to a finer tolerance. Tubes are loaded into a jig that then fires silicone carbide or diamond particles through it to quickly smooth them out. Each tube was checked by hand to ensure it was within spec before processing further. Their seven large CNC machines are used for processing flat or square bar stock. While there, they were being used to process titanium used for the conch hot ends. We also got to see where they keep all of their raw materials, which ranged from copper, brass, steel, hardened steel, aluminum, and titanium. Moving on, it was time to check out the QC process on the main floor, which was more involved than I ever could have imagined. The first room for this is IPQC, or in-process QC. Here, parts are pulled from the processing floor by a dedicated team to verify everything is up to spec. This room contains four stations with high-powered microscopes where parts are placed and then examined. They check the orifice and threads using these machines. If an error is detected, the machine running the part is stopped and a technician is called to diagnose and correct the issue. In the corner of this room is another automated microscope able to check multiple dimensions at the same time with extremely high accuracy. They also had a gear checking tool that's used to mesh a tool containing the teeth for the part being checked with the teeth of whatever gear it needs verification. It's able to detect any vibrations caused by errors or verify that the teeth are within spec. Lastly is a row of machines used to check the internal smoothness and diameter. For this, a part is cut in half, secured in place, and a fine pin is ran across it. The reading from this pin verifies that the part has been produced as expected. As part of their ISO certification, an original run of each unique part being produced is kept for a minimum of five years. Next, we walked into the cleaning room. This room contains a massive machine that takes the trays of parts and passes it through a three-stage cleaning process. The first is a rough clean, the second is a finer clean, and lastly is the drying stage. Other than loading the trays into a basket and pulling them out, it is an automated process. I asked what the machine uses for cleaning and was told it's a combination of ultrasonic and vacuum. The clean parts coming out of the machine were absolutely gorgeous. From here we moved into the next QC room, which is for the finished batches. Here, 20% of all finished parts are checked for their critical dimensions and 5% of other general dimensions. This process uses the same microscopes and testing equipment that we previously looked at. It's also where some post-processing is done for parts that need additional manual cleaning. While here, conch heat sinks were being processed to prepare them for shipping to be anodized at another facility. Next, we moved up to the third floor to check out the assembly workshop. This is a wide open floor where assembly is done for parts that require additional processing. While there, they were working on assembling the Apis II the newly released extruder from Fetus. Gear assemblies are already pressed fit, which makes the assembly process much quicker. From here, each extruder is assembled in only a few minutes. I also liked that they checked every single board to make sure that the filament sensor was working correctly. Next, we moved into another assembly room dedicated to nozzles. This room contained a handful of presses used to insert all of the silicone carbide and end coat inserts into the body of the nozzle. These presses are also used for installing the heat brakes onto the longer nozzle tubes. 
This process was really cool to see, and I was really surprised at just how large the inserts were before being mated into the nozzle bodies. This room also had a few fiber lasers, which were used with 3D printed jigs to quickly etch details about the nozzles onto them, such as the nozzle size. At the end of this room is another inspection station to verify the parts before they move forward. Also on this floor is a room containing a range of different printers used for testing the parts. While here, they had a couple Bamboo Lab printers running test prints with their conch hotend. For each batch, even after all of the previous inspections, a complete unit is pulled and thrown into the printer to complete a task to verify that everything is working as expected. Moving to the second floor, we have the warehouse. Here is another room dedicated to QC, which is the appearance inspection. Each part is checked by hand to make sure that they are free from any imperfections or blemishes. These wouldn't be things affecting performance, but are just to ensure that the completed units have been correctly cleaned before going into their final packaging. This room also contained a machine to check for the coating. While 90% of all production is done in this facility, the remaining 10% is done by other partners. These include things like coatings and anodizing. When these parts are received, they pull a unit from each batch, place it in this machine and have it run between a 6 to 12 hour cycle. This process checks for oxidation by causing the parts to rust. If the coating has been applied correctly, there should be no rust, but if rust is detected, they know there was an issue with the coating that needs to be further investigated and corrected. The last room we moved into is the packaging room, where the finished parts are put in their containers before going into the warehouse or shipped out to their customers. Even after everything, this room has a final QC step and contains another microscope if the technician detects any potential issues. Hopefully, if there was anything, it would have been caught in a previous process, but this is the final step in their incredibly thorough processing. The warehouse floor has massive boxes of Gates belts, which are not manufactured by Runis, but they are one of the biggest distributors of them. They also have racks of finished Fetus products and OEM parts ready to go out. I noticed that there were multiple sections of the same part scattered throughout the racks and was told that they keep batches together and work in a first in, first out inventory system. After the stream, I got a little bit of a behind the scenes on how they process the Gates belts, which was super cool. I had no idea that these belts came as a massive loop and then were cut down to the desired width. They had a huge machine that the belt goes onto, which then chops the width down to whatever is needed, with the most common being 6 and 9 millimeters. Then another machine cuts them to the desired length and can even add a clasp onto the belts if needed. I love Gates belts and seeing how they come into the factory and how they're processed was something I really enjoyed. This room also contained a CNC welder that is used for parts that require more than just a press fit to bond the pieces together. This concluded our tour of the facility and left me completely blown away and inspired by the sheer level of organization, detail, and pride that the team takes in everything that they do. I had an idea of what I thought things would be like, but I never could have anticipated just how impressive their operation is. I want to give a massive thank you to Runis and their entire team for allowing me to have this opportunity to both visit and film their factory, and just for the extreme amount of hospitality they showed us while we were there. I've been a big fan of their products for years, and I can't wait to see what their next decade entails. I hope that you enjoyed this video, and I want to give a massive shout out to everybody that attended the live stream event. For anyone who missed it, I'll have it linked in the description. I know their team gathered some footage as well, so I'm not entirely sure if there is going to be another video coming. Be sure to subscribe to their channel if you haven't already to not miss it, and keep up to date on their latest news. Be sure to like and subscribe for more great videos. We make a video just about every single week, so there's always fresh content coming your way. And if you do want to support the channel further, I'll have links down below in the description over to our Patreon, where there are some really awesome rewards. Huge thank you to all of our existing Patreon supporters. I appreciate each and every one of you for allowing me to come back every single week and spend more time doing what I love, which is making content for you all to enjoy. On that note, this has been Daniel from ModBot. I look forward to seeing you guys in my next video. Peace, guys.